want to continue tonight our studies in Colossians. What I'd like to do tonight is to deal with some concluding admonitions, kind of bring everything into focus that we've been dealing with in this book. And I don't have a particular passage. What I want to do is deal with certain important aspects of the book in conclusion. It deals with concluding admonitions in Colossians, but I've entitled it, The Signs of True Believers Are Overcomers. Signs of True Believers Are Overcomers. And what I've done, I've more or less picked out the key idea or key verse in each chapter. And I think when we get into the study, you'll see that we're really bringing some things into focus that we've dealt with in other ways in the book as a concluding study. For example, I'm dealing with three signs of believers or overcomers. Out of chapter 1, I believe it's faith. Chapter 1, verse 23, persevering faith, continue in the faith, grounded and settled, of course, in the faith. And out of chapter 2, verse 8, the overcomers not only will have faith, but they'll not be deceived by man's philosophies and traditions and teachings as substitutes for the Word of God, and multitudes are being deceived by that very thing. Beware lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit after the tradition of men. That's precisely what we've got in institutional religion, the tradition of men. And the Word of God says not to be deceived by man's philosophy and his traditions after the rudiments of the world. It's patterned after the world. Even their methods of raising money are promoting their beliefs. They have their own PR, public relations attitude. He said, and not after Christ. And then the third sign is in chapter 3, and it's that of obedience. Actually, chapters 3 and 4 go together, so I'm taking them together. Obedience. After you get past verse 6 in chapter 4, it's hellos and goodbyes, as we've said. So really it's chapter 3 and six verses of chapter 4. Obedience. Now that's what I want to deal with tonight. I might say that obedience is in everything from setting your affection on things above to obedience in family relationships and so forth. It's the whole concept of obedience, as we will see. The signs of true believers. See if you have these signs in your life of obedience and faith and perception whereby you're not deceived by popular religion or some new doctrine from charismatic teachers or whatever. Now, just as we are informed in Deuteronomy 28 and verse 46, that sickness and adversity are signs upon those who are sinful in sin, are disobedient. It's called a sign. Sickness, adversity is a sign upon the unbelieving and sinful. So we're told by Jesus in Mark 16 that certain things are signs upon believers. And the first thing is a sign of faith. He says, if you have faith, then you'll have certain signs on you. You'll speak in new tongues. Must be still for today if you're a believer. You'll speak in new tongues. You lay hands on the sick and they'll recover. You can cast out demons and nothing deadly or poisonous will hurt you. That is, if you have faith, if you believe. Now, while... The miracles and the power to cast out demons and the power to speak in tongues and so on. While these things are signs that will follow true believers, nevertheless, it is the sign of faith itself, which is the basic sign upon a true believer or an overcomer. Faith itself is the sign because you wouldn't have the other signs without faith. And it's not having faith in your faith, as those who don't have faith sometimes charges with, but faith itself is the basic sign because you can't have any other sign without faith. 
because of unbelief, a lack of faith, Jesus could do no mighty works in his own hometown in Nazareth, according to Mark chapter 6. This is precisely why non-charismatic and a lot of charismatic bodies, for that matter, why they do not have the power of God in their midst is because they have not continued in the faith. Paul says to continue in the faith. He doesn't mean believe and get saved and believe for the baptism and believe occasionally when you need to be healed or something, but to continue in the faith. That means continuously. And for the same reason that Jesus could do no true work in his own hometown, it's the same reason why he can't work today. For the same reason. They didn't have faith, and today they have not continued in the faith, and so he can do no mighty work. And it's remarkable that he predicted it would be this way in the end time. That's another sign of the end time, by the way, that there will be no faith on the earth. He said, when the Son of Man returns, will he find any faith on the earth? The implication is he wouldn't. And if he came right now, he wouldn't find it. Oh, you say, we've got it. Well, there are about how many billion in the world? He's talking about faith in the world. And how many hundreds of millions who profess to be Christian? And they don't have any faith. They're not even sure they're saved, many of them. They don't even have faith for their salvation. You ask one, are you saved? Well, I hope so. You going to make it to heaven? Well, I'm hoping so. So Jesus said he would not find any faith. So one of the signs of overcomers is that when he returns, he'll have a body of people who have the sign of faith upon them. Not around their neck, I have faith, but the sign of faith in their life. Now most people will tell you that the sign in Deuteronomy is for today, but the sign in Mark 16 isn't. sign in Deuteronomy is sickness and adversity and trouble because of sin and unbelief. They believe in that. They believe in sickness and adversity and trouble. When people say it's not for today, I said it's believing for today. Because Jesus said these signs would follow them that believe. It's preaching the gospel for today. He said go preach the gospel. I'm quoting Mark 16 that they say it's not for today. He said go preach the gospel to every creature. And then these signs will follow them that believe. Now how can you divide it up and get away with it? Well, you won't. But professing Christians will argue that these signs are not for today in Mark 16. I mean, they'll look you in the eye and tell you they're not for today. Say, that's not for today. That was for the first century church to get it established. And they say it's not for today because they don't see it in their midst, in their church or in their institutional system. As well as to say a lot of charismatics are not seeing anything miraculous. So they say it's not for today because they don't see it in their churches. But the reason they don't see it in their churches is because they're not continuing in the faith for it. We're to continue in the faith for it. You see, not to believe in something because you don't see it within the realm of your religious experience is getting the cart before the horse. Because the Bible says believing is seeing. And so you're getting the cart before the horse if you say, well, I don't believe it because I don't see it. You have to believe it to see it. Why, well, a savage in South America could say, I don't believe in automobiles and radios. I've never seen one. With the same logic, you could say you don't believe that there's any electricity in those wires hidden now that you can't see them. Notice new ceiling. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Didn't have to take an offering. <laughs> of course, we could have had the ceiling sooner if we'd have put your name on a panel and said, buy a panel. Well, verily, you'd have your reward. Every time you look up to heaven, you'd have your reward. <laughs> if you put your name on a ceiling tile. You can't even see the wires. But you might as well argue that you don't believe in electricity because you can't see the electrons flowing through the wires that you can't see. Because to say you don't believe something because you don't see the manifestation of it within your religious realm of experience has got the cart before the horse because that's the world's philosophy, he says, to avoid that seeing is believing. Jesus said believing is seeing. Thomas, you've believed because you've seen, but blessed are those who believe and haven't seen. We're blessed if we believe we have the healing before we see it, if we have the answer before we see it. 
whatever we're praying about. Well, I don't know how important it is to you concerning faith, but I've got a couple of passages here. Hebrews 11:6. without faith, God says you can't please me. And Romans 14, 23, that which is not faith is sin. If you drove here and doubted that bridge would hold you up as you crossed it with your car, that was sin. What is not of faith is sin, Romans 14, 23. If you're sitting out there doubting the chair will hold you up, that's sin. Romans 14, 23, that which is not of faith is sin. If you don't believe you can eat bacon every morning, and I generally do, pork, you better not eat it because you'll be damned if you do. That's the word of God. That which is not of faith is sin. In fact, he's talking about eating meat. Now, it's not that professing Christians don't know that Jesus said what he said in Mark 16 to his church. It's not that they don't believe he said it. It's that because of the cost involved, they choose rather to believe what man is saying about what God said. And what's man saying about what God said? Well, if you've got a Bible, Mark 16, I don't know if you know it, but it's divided up by most teachers and preachers today. We've got verses 15 and 16, which read, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. They say that's for today, and then immediately there's a space there. And verses 17 to 20 is for the past, where Jesus said these signs will follow them. Go preach the word, and these signs will follow them that believe. In my name they'll lay hands on the sick, and they'll recover, cast out demons, speak in new tongues not be heard by deadly things. And they went everywhere preaching the word. God, you know, worked with them, confirming the word with signs following. And so we're told that we can take verses 15 and 16 literally, but not the rest of the chapter. Now, if you catch Christians off guard, church members off guard, they will admit that Mark 16 is all one statement. Jesus said it all together. It isn't dispensational. Be surprised what you can get people to admit if you catch them off guard. If they don't think, you know, they have to believe it for themselves. Because professing Christians know what he said. I remember hearing Jack Coe tell about a Methodist pastor. Of course, he was charismatic, Pentecostal, I guess. They were holding a meeting across the street from this Methodist church in, a, I guess, a Pentecostal storefront. That's about all you used to see. They didn't have enough chairs. God was healing people, and he went across the street one day during the meeting and asked the pastor, he had his study down in the basement, if he could borrow some chairs. Now, stay with what I'm talking about. You can get people to admit a lot of things if they don't think you're putting them on the spot. They will admit God said this or that. He asked if he could borrow some chairs because God was blessing the meeting. Why? Well, he said, you're that healer. I wouldn't let you have anything. Well, he said, no, I'm not the healer. Well, he said, where is he? I want to tell him something. He said, he's up there. He had his study in the basement. Oh, he's upstairs? He said, yes. <laughs> well, tell him to come down here. I want to tell him something about divine healing. He's all mixed up. He said, Jesus, this Methodist pastor would like for you to come down. He's got something to tell you about divine healing. <laughs> well, that kind of took his breath, and he said, well, you seem to have a little more sense than most of those healers. So he said, I've got a Ph.D. and all of this other. And he said, I know all about healing. I know all about the Bible. Just ask me anything. I can tell you. Ask me about healing. Well, he said, yeah, I've got a couple of questions I'd like answered. He said, there's a passage over in James 5 that says, Is any sick among you? Let him call for the apostles and let them anoint him with oil in the name of the Lord. And he stopped him right about there and said, No, this Methodist pastor who doesn't believe in healing. It doesn't say the apostles. It says, Call for the elders of the church, you know, the pastors, and let them anoint them with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith will heal the sick and the Lord will raise him up. <laughs> oh, he said, What about that? Well, I got another one. Mark 16 where Jesus said, go preach the gospel, and these signs would follow the apostles. They'd lay hands on the sick. He said, wait a minute, you're mixed up again. Jesus didn't promise the signs just to the apostles, but to believers, any believer, a work for believers. <laughs> and about that time, he discovered he had his foot in his mouth. 
Well, that kind of stuck with me. I remember hearing him tell that. How that it's amazing what you can get Christians or professing Christians to admit if you catch them off guard. But it's both dangerous and dishonest to look the word of God in the face and then to stand up before the people and deny it. Deny its validity for today. Amen. Or to water it down. Or to explain away its meaning. As if, you know, we can't trust God to say what he meant and to mean what he said. We can trust him to do what he said. God's going to judge those who take his word and say, well, that's presumption to believe his word. Or you can't really take this to be literal because, you know, that was for the apostolic age or something else. And God is already judging some of them who are writing their books. They're ending up in mental institutions and their wives are suffering incurable cancers or brain tumors and things. Many things are happening already, but God is going to judge all of those who take his plain word and twist it. You see, he tells you here in Mark 16 that the signs will follow those who believe. And when God gives you both his word, and by the way, the signs are to confirm the word, when he gives you both the word and the sign, and then you reject it or ridicule it, then you see he's got nothing left to offer you, nothing else. And you're going to have to suffer the same judgment of Matthew 12 if you're opposing the sign. The signs are given, he says in Mark 16, to confirm the word that's preached. And it's both dishonest and dangerous to hear the word and then to see the sign that confirms the word and ridicule the sign. Jesus said these were signs that were on believers. So if they're not on you, then you must not be a believer. Now you can't have it both ways. So the first sign of a true believer, an overcomer, is faith. That is, his faith will be evidenced by the results it produces in his life. He won't need a sign around his neck. And the basic test of anyone's faith is whether or not it remains constant. Paul says, continue in the faith. That is, perseverance in the faith. Colossians 1.23 is the basic sign of faith. It's not whether or not you've got faith tonight, but will you continue in the faith? Or you had faith last week, but will you continue in the faith? And those who have genuine faith are those who persevere in the faith in the face of all trial, all temptation, in the face of all teaching of men, our opposition from others. You see, all those things I've mentioned are where some people lose their faith. They lose it through the teaching of men. That's significant, that you don't lose your faith because you're listening to what man is saying. Many who started out in faith ended up in doubt and unbelief because they began to listen to what men teach. Like multitudes have been deceived by the shepherdship error that teaches that you have to submit yourself to your covering and of course they don't have any faith. That's the one thing that characterizes that movement. There's no faith. In fact, one of the leaders said, my ministry is in a warfare with the faith message. And he meant this church when he said that. Because this church has a consistent faith message. It doesn't say, you know, faith is trusting the doctors like some faith teachers do. And of course, they won't let you have faith because you're under your shepherd and covering. So people have lost their faith because they got into those groups. Or the faith and presumption error that tells us that to trust the written word of God is presumption. And so, again, multitudes have been robbed of their faith because they're listening to the teachings of men. You don't have to lose your faith in a real trial somewhere. Just listen to error and absorb that, and you can lose your faith. Because very few people have faith today. And so we have to be very careful, you see, that we don't allow men to talk us out of our faith. In the final analysis, those that God is going to use in this end time are those who continue in the faith, not those shepherdship babies that can't have post toasties for breakfast unless their covering says they can are those faith and presumption basket cases that you know just can't make it through unless they have their doctors and pills to help them with their ills God is going to use those who continue absolutely 100% in the faith how can he use anybody else I mean 
if everything operates by faith, then faith is the key to everything. Well, the first sign is going to be persevering faith. Now let's come to the second, and that's Colossians 2.8, where Paul here tells us not to be led astray by the philosophies, the vain teachings of men. Beware, lest any man spoil you. That means deceive you, mislead you. Through philosophy, tradition of men, teachings of men, creeds of men, and not after Christ. And again, as we have been stressing about losing one's faith, this is the way they lose it. Through listening to the philosophies and traditions of men. And many of them sound quite scriptural. If you don't know the Bible, you can be deceived by them. You know, one of the tests of whether or not a person is coordinated, one of the tests, psychological tests, sometimes it is given to test whether or not you know you're well coordinated or if you can think in a logical manner, is they give you a lot of pegs, square pegs, round pegs, and boards, and all sorts of shapes and sizes, and you're supposed to see how well coordinated you are by putting those things in the right holes and right spaces in a certain amount of time. Now that may not sound like much, but a lot of people can't match things up too well. It's interesting how this concept applies to some of the things we're talking about tonight. How that people are constantly trying to put square pegs in round holes and they won't fit. They're taking the teachings of men, the creeds and philosophies, and trying to superimpose them upon the message, the pattern of the New Testament, it won't work. And they don't know why their lives are not victorious or why faith doesn't work or prayers are not answered, but it's because they're trying to put round pegs in square holes or square pegs in round holes or whatever. Now, we're assuming you understand that the hole will only take a certain peg. If you've got a two-inch hole and a one-inch peg, you can put any kind of a peg in it. I just said that because I didn't want to lose anybody on my illustration. People are always trying to do what they can't do, like this notion taught in most churches that you just are supposed, when you have a need, to pray and pray and pray and pray until you either get God's attention because you've bombarded heaven so long or... You just give up the quest and accept the fact that you're not going to get healed or not get an answer because it's not God's will to answer you. Now, you see, when you pray and pray and pray, the repetitious prayer, that isn't faith, and such a prayer can never get an answer because, you see, you're trying to put square pegs in round holes. It can never get an answer because Jesus said you couldn't. He said, when you pray, believe you have received. That's just one square peg going in a square hole. He said, when you pray, believe you have received, and then you'll have it. And so to pray over and over for the same thing won't work for the simple reason it can't work. Because you see, you've got to line your prayers up with God's conditions or the will of God. You can just push and shove and Hammer all day long, but you're not going to be able to get square plugs and round holes. And the reason you can't is because they don't fit. So you can't take man's methods and try to fit them into God's program. Since less than 10% of prayers are answered for most Christians, and that's a fact that can't be debated. I read it somewhere, and I think it's an overestimate by about 9% at least. It's more like one half of 1%. Name somebody you know that ever got an answer to prayer all their Christian life. If anybody ever did, you know they wrote a book about it or <laughs> told you about it for the rest of their life and that sort of thing. So they don't really expect to get an answer. That's why they put an if on it, if it be thy will. But since less than 10% of prayers, using these statistics I read somewhere, receive an answer for most Christians, you would think somebody would start asking why. They would start raising the question of whether or not the promises really work, you know, where you can really trust God or not, or they would start asking questions about the methods of prayer they've been taught. Because God didn't ordain prayer in order for you just to spin your wheels, as it were, or just sink deeper into the mire. But he expects, you know, to answer those prayers. People don't ask why, they just keep trying to put square pegs in round holes. Because, well, this is the way I've been taught. See, most are trying to do what is impossible to do, hoping some way, somewhere, somehow, someday, that God will take pity on them and 
Maybe one of these pegs will fit in the right hole. But it'll never work because it can't work. And it can't work because Jesus said it can't work. And he said that all through the word. And he said it in another way. I use the pegs and holes illustration, but he used another one. He said you can't put new wine in old wineskins. <laughs> and they keep trying to do it. Now that won't work either way. You can't take Paul's mention here in chapter 2 and verse 8 of philosophies and traditions and creeds and teachings of men. You can't take the old institutional creeds and teachings and doctrines and methods and patterns and religious organizations and fit them into the New Testament pattern. And they keep trying to do it. They say, this is a church. Or this is the New Testament, this or that. Or whatever they do, they will say, we're doing it in Jesus' name, as if that's going to validate it. But it's not what he said, it's what they said. It's what men have established. And of course you can turn that around, which is the obvious way, and you can't take a work of the Spirit, baptism of the Holy Spirit, speaking in tongues, healing, the faith message, and force it into the institutional system. Amen. I mean, they will regurgitate that just as quickly as you try to present it. They'll do it every time. They've got no other choice. Because you can't put the new wine into old wine skins. And that's why they'll always reject the charismatic move. That is the institutional system will, because if it didn't reject it, it would not any longer be an institutional system if it received it. And you'll never live long enough to see them receive the charismatic outpouring. It'll always be outside the system of man. You would just show you don't know history to debate the point, but man has always rejected any work of the Spirit all the way through history. Always has. Jesus' day, today, Middle Ages, Old Testament. Always reject a pure work of the Spirit and substitute their own thing. It's like this charismatic renewal, stressing a spirit of unity instead of the unity of the Spirit. And you can never put that square peg in a round hole. You can't take charismatic renewal and try to fit it into the charismatic movement that is God's side of the charismatic movement. What I'm saying is God has not sent the Spirit to renew man's system. They're talking about Lutheran renewal, Charis Lutherans, and Charis Methodists, Charis Presbyterians. God has not sent the Spirit to renew man's institutional system. That's man's system. But he has sent the Spirit to restore the New Testament pattern, which is what I trust that we have some semblance of here, the New Testament pattern, not boards and rules and regulations and creeds and what have you. Why, even when we set down ten requirements, we stressed on there, these are not laws or rules that you have to subject yourself to. These are principles that any Christian ought to be willing to submit himself to as a Christian. If he's just going to sit at home, he ought to look at those ten things and say, that's right, I believe that. We said on there that we're not putting you under any legalistic system. And did you notice in all that there was no statement of faith, ten things we believe, 25 things that we adhere to. I believe the Bible is inspired. I believe Jesus was virgin born. I believe in the physical resurrection. Well, we teach those things every week. We expect if you are a Christian, you believe those things. But you see, as soon as these men start making up their lists, you'll get another list and they'll be either shorter or longer on what they require and no one even agrees on basic things. So we just say the Bible, the whole Bible, and nothing but the Bible, and it's that simple. Amen. And let the Spirit of God that we all have guide us into what the Bible has to say to each of us. But you can't take the work of the Spirit and put it into man's system. It'll just never work. Amen. This is why a charismatic renewal can't work, because Jesus said it couldn't. Over in John chapter 15, Jesus said to his church, Without me you can do nothing. Over in Acts chapter 1, he said, without the Holy Spirit, you can do nothing. And the reason there is so much nothing being done is because men won't submit themselves to the fact that without Jesus, 
They can do nothing. Now, I don't mean because you add his name to something, it's Jesus. But that you get into his word and whatever he says, like Sermon on the Mount, that nobody takes literally. I had ministerial students wanting to fight me over that. And you're not supposed to fight, according to Sermon on the Mount. Oh, were they upset. I've told you about it, but the point is, just because you say Jesus or Jesus is Lord doesn't even mean you're in the kingdom, according to two verses in the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 7, 21, 22. And so he said, without me, you can do nothing. That means you've got to know what he said and do what he said, not what your church says. And so the reason there's so much nothing being done, he said, without me, you can do nothing, is because they insist on trying to put the square pegs in the round holes. They're going to do it their way. Man's going to do it his way instead of God's way. And we will never succeed in anything until we start developing the attitude that we have to find out what he said and what he wants and do that. Amen. That's the only way that you're going to get things to fit and to work. And as we study church history, we see in our generation a repetition of what happened a century ago, and you can go all the way back. One generation of Christians will come and go, followed by another generation of Christians. They will come and go. Followed by another generation of Christians, they will come and go. And very little is ever accomplished that is fruitful, effective, and lasting. That is, that lines up with the Word of God. Oh, you might find an old church building somewhere that they made a museum out of. That lasted. <laughs> but here we've been 2,000 years in this walk with the Holy Spirit given. And most have rejected Him. 2,000 years and the church is less powerful today than it was in the first century. Amen. And the same Spirit is offered the church. I mean, you can take all the charismatics together and it's not as powerful as it was in the first century. It's not as spiritual. Most churches will criticize the Corinthians and they're speaking in tongues and they don't even have the spirit they have or the gifts. So they don't have the power and they're not as spiritual. Criticizing them for being carnal and they don't even have the spirit themselves. They're making fewer converts. I've told you stories of missionaries who labor for years to make a handful of converts. They need something. The baptism of the Holy Spirit would help the signs of Mark 16. When I taught in the seminary, there was a missionary came, I believe from India, and said, we've been laboring 10 years on the field. We think we've made two, and he used the term dubious converts. If it had made two, that was pathetic, but he said dubious. In other words, they weren't even sure. They weren't even sure they would be there when they got back. Church today has substituted man's way. Medical signs for the gifts of healing. Organization and boards. Religious education for the anointing of the Holy Spirit. And prayer is just, as I say, unanswered is the key word concerning prayer today. And you would think people would begin to ask why. All of this fruitlessness and lack of power and lack of any lasting fruit or results. They don't ask why. They just keep trying to shove square pegs and round holes. Because, well, that's the way that my pastor did it, or that's the way my granddaddy did it, or that's the way our church does it. So the principle that has to prevail in the final analysis, if God is going to do anything through us in this end time, is that we will not just follow the leaders, not just be those who do something because, you know, well, our grandfathers did it, or the Baptists did it. He says don't follow Baptist philosophy or Lutheran tradition, or Methodist creeds, or charismatic teachers just because they're charismatic, and not follow Christ. In other words, he makes the contrast between those who will follow men and those who will follow Christ. Now. I don't think I can overemphasize the importance of that. The sign that's going to be on those who overcome and God uses in this end time will be those who have the pure word, those who have paid the cost to learn the word, and they're following Jesus Christ. 
Now you can almost count on your right hand those who are following Jesus Christ in the charismatic movement. They're following some man, some leader. In fact, a lot of them are glad to get back in their old denominational systems. I keep reading about where some of the charismatic pastors who were put out now are all smiles. The system is taking them back in. All you can do is shake your head because you wonder why they need the Holy Spirit if, you know, it isn't going to make any difference in their lives that the system wouldn't have them. So they have conformed now to the place that the system's taking them back. Some of them I've ministered with. And now they're happy to be back in the system. Well, another sign, the third sign I want to deal with is perhaps the longest one, and that is the sign of obedience, chapters 3 and 4. Like the sign of faith, the sign of obedience is a basic sign that will follow those who are going to overcome. But it doesn't matter that you have the sign of faith or the sign of having a pure word. For if you have not obedience, it will profit you nothing. You remember Paul in 1 Corinthians 13 said, you can have all of these other things. You can have faith to move mountains. If you have not love, it'll profit you nothing. And so we can say, you can have faith to move a mountain, but if you have not obedience, it's going to profit you nothing. Of course, they have to go together, faith and obedience, but it's possible, we're saying, for a while at least, to move some mountains, get answers to prayer, get healed, demonstrate great faith, because you're hearing the word of faith, you're sitting under a word of faith, but you see, in the final analysis, just having that faith is not going to produce in your life what Jesus expects, and in the final analysis, he'll reject you with your faith. I'm talking about end time move. I'm not talking about salvation, but faith is not an end in itself, and we've never taught here that it's an end in itself. But faith, while it is the key to everything, is not an end. And this ministry has taught you that you are to live what you profess. And I've got a verse that I'd like to share with you, 1 John 3, 21, 22, that says just what we're trying to get across to you, that you've got to have both these things together. 1 John 3, 20, 21. For if our heart condemn us, God is greater than our heart and knoweth all things. Beloved, if our heart condemn us not, then we have confidence toward God that whatever we ask, we receive of Him. Then He tells you why you can get what you believe for. Because we keep His commandments and we do those things that are pleasing in His sight. Now there they are together. He says... You can have confidence that when you pray in faith, you will receive whatever you ask because you obey him. You keep his word and you do those things which please him. And you can't have it both ways. Oh, for a while, you can have faith. I know of people who get saved, get the baptism, and just launch out in faith. And anybody can have a great faith. It's not a special gift. We're not talking about the gift of faith. I remember a man that drove through several states with an empty tank, no gas, because, well, he'd heard our teaching on faith and did that. But he was not exactly mature because he said something to me after he came to our church that revealed that he didn't have any depth yet. I didn't criticize him for it. It certainly humbled me, which was all right. I guess we need a little of that but with a doctor's degree and all these books and all, and I was traveling the country then, he thought I had a church this size then. I had a few people rattling around in a living room. And he showed his disappointment right away because I wasn't some big Ike somewhere. But he had the faith that he could drive across several states without any gasoline in his tank. So what have you got when you've got faith? I'm just saying by his remark, he didn't understand there were only 12 who followed Jesus, you know, and if you have to go through all that, well, it's like bailing the ocean out with a spoon. You just want to hand them a big box of tape since they start listening to deeper life and crucified life, and you won't count heads. Oh, he said, I thought you were pastor of a big church. 
few people rattling around in the living room. So you've got to have faith and obedience in order to please God, in order to, well, even keep your faith in the final analysis. Now, what is obedience for a Christian? Obedience under grace. Because Jesus shows in his teaching that it was possible in the Old Testament dispensation, you see, to be obedient outwardly and yet disobedient inwardly. You remember he spoke of lust in the heart and anger and so forth, and you could obey the law outwardly and still be disobedient inwardly. Now I find that many Christians would like to have a church to belong to where they could set up a set of rules and they could type out on a card and carry them around in their wallet a set of rules. Here's how I act in every situation. Let's see, somebody stole my pencil stub. What do I do? You don't take his... Baby playing patty cake in the cereal. What do I do? You see, most people, many people, we'll make it many, it's probably most, would like to have a set of rules established by the church how you can act in every situation and how you can require your children to act. You know, rules based on the Word of God because they find it easier to look in their wallet and see what you do. Oh yes, that's rule number eight. Than to change their lives. They find it easier to obey something outwardly than to deal with their own heart inwardly is what I've said. And so you can't set up rules. Obedience is a matter of the heart. We're talking about obedience will be a sign of end time overcomers. It's a matter of the heart and not the head. In fact, it's Romans 6.17 where Paul said that God be thanked that ye were the servants of sin. Then he said, but now you have obeyed from the heart that form of teaching that was presented to you. Heart obedience is what we're talking about. So if you find yourself or your children not willing to obey, not really having a desire to come here to find out what the will of God is so you can obey it, rather than come to see how much you can stomach, if it is not in your heart to desire this, if you find yourself having difficulty putting into practice what we teach here from the Word of God, if you find that you have to lay on the shelf about half of what you hear, or whatever percentage for that matter, before you can swallow it and chew it and digest it, you ought to consider the possibility that maybe that's a sign to you that you need a new heart. Because the sign of overcomers is they have a heart that wants to obey. Paul said here in Romans 6, 17, you have obeyed from the heart that teaching that I gave you. Not outward obedience, but from the heart. And so if you find it a struggle all the time to obey, I'd just as soon you wouldn't tell me if you're going to be like some have been over the years. Oh, I really had to struggle with that one. Or it took me a while really to adjust after I came to faith assembly. Or some things I'd never heard them before and I really had to walk them out. I just assume you'd keep that to yourself. You don't edify me. And I don't think you're honoring God. I mean, it may be true about some things that you never heard of, like you don't sue somebody that takes your car or whatever. But you see, that's in the Sermon on the Mount. It's been there all along. It's not God's fault because you didn't know it. Ignorance of the Sermon on the Mount is no excuse. So you ought to consider the possibility you need a new heart if you're always struggling with everything that we teach here or that you read out of the Word of God. If the Word of God is always convicting you, consider the possibility you need to go to the cross because the sign of a believer, an overcomer is, he has a willing heart to obey, an obedient heart, a heart of obedience. You have obeyed from the heart that form of teaching I delivered. Now, some parents who come to me about their children, teenagers and younger, older, you know, and ask questions about what they should do about a situation because they see what the rest of the religious world does and permits and what the Word of God actually says is quite different. And I found that most of the time, again, we'll say many times, what they really want is a set of rules. Give us a rule a law, a procedure we can lay down and that child will obey it. And I have to remind them there are no rules in the New Testament. 
that you can't legislate morality. You can't legislate true obedience. And if we had a set of rules to give you and then you would take those home and require your children to obey them and they obeyed you because you made them, you're bigger, you know, and didn't obey from the heart, they're still disobedient to you because obedience is from the heart, not outward obedience, not from the head. So it's your responsibility not only to teach your children, but to show them why they should want to obey as Christians. Just don't lay down rules and impose them and think you're going to produce well-adjusted members of society just because you've got laws and you impose them and discipline them when they break them, but show them why they ought to want to obey them. If they don't have the want to, then you can get to the place where you can suggest that they consider the possibility they don't have a new heart. I mean, why should we think children should have some sort of a struggle that we don't have? Or why should we think that children should be required any less to obey God out of their heart willingly? If they're born again, why shouldn't they love to obey Jesus? Jesus said, my sheep hear my voice, and they follow me. Temptations are no greater to you. I don't believe that nonsense than they are for us. We have our kind of temptation. You've got yours. We have the cost to pay to be overcomers. You've got a cost to pay. And so we are not to just teach children what's right, but we are to show them that this is what you should want to do. You claim to be a Christian? Yes, I'm a Christian. You're baptized in spirit, speak in tongues. You know, five years old, a lot of them do. Well, then expect them to want to obey Jesus. Don't give in to the pressure that just because they're young, you know, that they have greater temptations and we will not expect as much out of them. Expect as much out of them as you do yourself. Where do you find the Bible that children are made any special class? Are old people, are white or colored, are whatever? Tall, short, fat, or thin? If you're a Christian, you should have a heart that wants to obey. And if they don't have a heart that wants to obey, you ought to suggest to them that they need a new heart. You ought to read Galatians. In fact, you can hear our tapes on Galatians. If you can stand them, they get pretty strong at points. Read the book of Galatians and you'll see what it means to be under grace because we've shown you there you can't lay down rules. You can't legislate for your children or for yourself. The church can't do it for you. And Paul says that if you do this, you're under bondage. He says in Galatians 5, 1, to stand fast in your liberty and be not entangled again with the yoke of bondage. Verse 13, he says, you've been called unto liberty. Of course, he says only use not liberty as an occasion to the flesh, but we can't set up rules for you. We can't legislate what you should do with respect to what your child just did, how you should react. We teach principles here because the New Testament teaches principles. We can give some suggestions. Some person, you know, asks, what am I to do about a situation my child just doesn't seem to want to conform at this point, and the child's always looking at what other parents let their children do in this situation. What am I to do? Well, we've been giving you pointers on what to do. Principles. I'll remind you of some, and maybe add a few thoughts to it. One is, parents who themselves are not consistent, are not obedient to their father up there, will not inspire much respect and obedience out of their children. Now, we've already taught on that, but I just want to remind you of it again. And secondly, if you are obedient to your father, then you should require and expect obedience from your children as a father, as long as they're under your responsibility and care. If they're still under your responsibility and they're 21, they should submit to your wishes in whatever matter. We're assuming that you're obedient to your father and you're following the word. If you are obedient, you should require obedience. If you're not, you're not going to inspire much obedience out of your children. You can make them obey, but we're talking about obedience from the heart. Children should obey from the heart, just like we should obey from the heart. And you should not try to lay your responsibility to get obedience out of them or the right kind of conduct out of them on the church or on the pastor. Some people actually will bring 
a situation into the church wanting the church, that is the pastor, to discipline the child in the sense of a verbal rebuke or admonishment. You should be handling your own situations at home and not lay that responsibility on the church or the pastor. Now again, we can't set up rules on that. We're not closing any doors to helping people who need help, but you have the responsibility. And so many people don't recognize as parents they have the responsibility to require obedience and get it. And so they'll run to the pastor. Oh, I could write a book on how many people have come to me about their children. And how many of you have I gone to about my children? We can go back over the years. Nobody. And you know, not only will they try to put their responsibility on the church to set up some sort of rigid discipline or rules to control their children. Every time something new comes up, they'll be up here again. Well, I've got this problem. And they want a rule, you know, or want you to deal with it. They'll not only do that concerning the church, but they'll do that concerning God. They'll say, well, I can't do a thing with him or her. So I prayed and turned them over to the Lord. Well, the reason it's so quiet is because probably too many of you have said that. We're not talking about faith. We're talking about your responsibility. I can't do a thing with him. I've prayed. I've turned him over to God. Now, you wouldn't say that if you could swim and your child was out there drowning. You wouldn't sit down and start praying, well, Lord, I'm turning him over to you. No, you would do what you could. Meet your responsibility. And then thirdly, as we said in another study, begin early. Training them early. Is six months too early? No, too late. You wait six months, you're going to have a lot of housebreaking to do. Over the years. I don't know how many homes I've been in that they have never started. Seven years, 13 years, 19, they haven't even started beginning. I mean Christian homes. And you could write a book on what you see in homes. Most homes, I suppose, have no conception. I'm talking about Christian homes of how to rear children, scripturally. I remember when I was speaking in a city about a week in a meeting, and of course, sometimes you go out and eat in somebody's home, and here were members of this church and prominent, educated people, charismatic, speaking in tongues, And so we were invited out to eat, my wife and I, I think a Sunday afternoon. There was, I believe, another couple there, guests. And they had two children, one seven, one about nine or ten. And it came mealtime. You know, you can't stay all day, so you're there, you have some fellowship, then have to get back and study and pray. But mealtime, the wife calls, come to the table, and everybody heads for the table. Except little Johnny over there, seven years old. He's been playing the piano, whatever he calls play. Well, I don't want to quit and stop and go eat until I finish my song. And Daddy rushed over not to discipline what he should have done. We've got company guests. You don't talk that way to your parents, that you're not coming till you're ready. That's what you would expect. I mean, you kind of would expect it. He rushed over there. Oh, honey, I didn't know you were playing your song and put his elbow on the top of the piano. We want to hear it. Now you go ahead and finish and we'll wait. And he listened to every note till he finished his minuet in G or whatever it was. <laughs> oh, pathetic. You know what's going on in the minds of people if they've got a mind. Well, I'm not so sure what went on in anybody else's mind. That's what went on in my mind. Here's a seven-year-old that has that family wrapped around his finger. Now, if it's that way in your house, it may be time to leave or change. <laughs> I didn't want to look up, see if anybody left. Oh, I'll tell you, we could tell you stories about people who've not begun. So how can you require obedience when it's important when you've let the children take over the home or the wife? And then, fourthly, instill in your children the reason for obedience. That it's a sign of their new birth. Heart obedience is a sign you're born again. You ought to go back to the cross. 
If you can't obey, if you don't find it in your heart to obey, if you come here for any other reason than to find out what the will of God is to obey it, well, you're certainly in the wrong camp and here by the wrong motivation because there's only one reason we meet, and that is to hear from the Lord through His Word so we can go out and become what He's molding and shaping us into. You know, as well as I do, most people get saved and then get a pew, occupy a seat. They sit there till Jesus comes. They don't know they're supposed to change or do anything or be anything or grow into anything. They're in a rut and they think, you know, that's the way it is. You stay in the rut until you're raptured. So instill in your children why they should want to obey. It's evidence that they have a new heart. If they don't obey out of love, if they don't obey you willingly, parents whom they can see, then you tell them that it's inconsistent for them to say that they love God and will obey Him whom they can't see. First John chapter 4, where he says that how can you say you love God whom you don't see when you don't love your brother whom you can see? And so it is with obedience. If you do not obey your parents because you love to obey them, if you can't obey and love those whom you can see, then don't tell us you love God and you're obeying Him whom you can't see. The Bible says you can't do that. You show your children if they don't obey willingly out of love, it's evidence they need a new heart. If they don't have their affection set on things above, it's evidence they need a new heart. If they love this world, they need a new heart. All of that's Bible. 1 John 2, if you love the world, then the love of God is not in your heart. The Bible says it. And I don't know why we should expect any less of you at 17 or 13 than we do of ourselves. And that's what's the matter with America is because, well, they make exceptions because of age. Too young, too old. Somewhere you ought to get to the place where you just obey the Lord because you love Him. And quit making excuses. Well, I'm weak or my background or I came out of a bad environment or I'm only 13 or I'm 98 and too weak to do anything that I should. Just start obeying God because He's God and you're His child. I mean, but now in this church, that shouldn't offend anybody because we've been saying it in about 10,000 ways. We labor to teach you what the Word of God says. You cannot lay down rules. We can't lay them down in the church for obedience for our children or your own obedience. We've taught you many things out of the Word of God as a part of the whole counsel of God, and we've taught you the principles in how to apply those things. So quit asking me for a rule or what you should do in a situation. Because when you do, what do I tell you? I give you a principle. Over and over again, people ask me about glasses or I've got the restriction on my license. What do I do? Have you read the faith book? It's either yes or no. There's no other answer. And when it's no, I say, well, there's where the answer is. And when it's yes, well, now you've read it. Now go back and put it into practice. Chapter 1. Six pages, I think. It won't cause you to lose any sleep to have to deal with six pages. I tell them the answer's there. I don't tell you what to do if you've got a restriction on your license, and yet they keep asking that. I don't know what to do, but I know what the principles are, and when it's faith, that's what you'll do. We don't bar anyone from coming in here if they have glasses or a crutch or a man's pants on and a woman or whatever. I think we might raise an eyebrow if a man started doing what women are doing and wore a woman's dress in here. We might raise an eyebrow. I'm sure we would. But what I'm saying is we haven't set up rules and stood at the door and said you've got to follow these rules, but we've taught you the principles. Take the matter of faith. You can't legislate faith. You can't set a rule on how you should act if you're going to have a baby or what you should do if you're going through a trial. You should take the principles that we teach here, faith principles, and apply them to every situation, whether it's childbearing or finances for business, physical trial, whatever. Because you see, when you come to me and ask, what should I do? How should I apply my faith or what's required in this situation? It's evidence, first of all, that you're not maturing in the faith. And secondly, as you know, I've never told you what to do. I say, here's the principle that applies, if we can tell you that. 
Sometimes it requires more than that out of you, like read, study, digest the faith book. I said to someone recently, do you have such and such a book? You know, God has given us this literature so that it will help you, so you can walk through these things. I said, do you have that book? You know, I'm ready to give them a book if they don't have it. Well, no, I gave it away. Well, that isn't going to help, is it? Well, I'll give you another one. That didn't get any response, no favorable response, whatever. That means I've got to read and study and, whoo, isn't there a shortcut? Can't you just wave your hand over the leprosy and it'll go away, you know, like Naaman wanted Elisha to do. No, it won't work that way. Discipline and study. And so I'll say it's chapter one of the faith book or it's in the deeper life book. You know, if there's a simple answer, you give them one. Don't misunderstand what we're saying, but we can't tell you how to apply your faith. There are principles involved. I don't know how you're going to react to any situation tomorrow, but you see, when you've got the Word of God working in your heart, then you begin to apply the principles. There are no rules for faith. And as I say, we've covered the whole revelation here in one way or another, like the biblical roles of husbands and wives. We've not told you how to act in your marriage. We've not told children what they had to do or parents what they must require. We've laid out the principles and said, now here's a principle that will work in such and such a situation. If you bother long enough to get the tapes on the restoration of the biblical roles of husband and wife, then you'll be able to work out your difficulties because, you see, there are principles all through there as well as much other teaching. So we expect a person, when they come to faith assembly and sit under the teaching for a while to get into the literature, get into the tapes, and sit under the teaching, we expect them to start demonstrating this in their life, not constantly forming a line up here. As someone said, that line ought to be people up there sharing with you what God has done. And of course there can be exceptions. There are people who really need help, and we're never talking about them. But you see, they're not that many. They're usually coming in from somewhere. Now, as I've said so many times, that never shortens the line, so I haven't been guilty of offending anyone yet by talking about the line. <laughs> because it just has been getting bigger and bigger. But you see, we expect once you hear the word, to study that out and to pray that into your heart and then begin to put it into practice. We actually expect children who attend this church to obey their parents. Not to have a parent up here, my child won't obey me. That's a reflection on the parent. But at the same time, we expect the children, Ephesians 6, 1, obey your parents in everything. This is right in the sight of the Lord. Colossians 3, 20, obey your parents in all things. We expect that. We expect children who come to this church not to want to look like the world, act like the world, talk like the world, think like the world. We just expect that. And if you want to look like, talk like, dress like, and be like the world, then you ought to consider the possibility you've never been born again. Because my Bible says in 2 Corinthians 5, 17, if any child is in Christ Jesus, that child's a new creature. All things are passed away and all things have become new. What has become new in your life since you've been coming to Faith Assembly? If you're born again, you're going to be able to stand up here as a 12-year-old or a 16-year-old or whatever and testify to what's different. And I just want to keep emphasizing, if you want to be like the world, then you do not have God in your heart because he said in 1 John 2 to love not the world, neither the things in the world. For any man who loves this world does not have the love of God in his heart. And not to have that means you're not saved. So we just expect obedience. But we can't lay out rules how you act when Johnny spills the milk or sasses back or whatever. We can tell you when you're not doing what you should, but we can't legislate because you're not in bondage. You want to go to shepherdship covering meetings, you want to be in bondage. You're not going to be in bondage here. And therefore, because we teach the whole revelation concerning principles of conduct, we expect husbands to set their homes in order, not with a club, but with love, and to be an example so that out of respect your children and wife will want to obey you. Now, I don't know how many husbands that come and sit in these seats have their home in order. I don't even know if any of you are trying to get it in order. Where you take the responsibility. 
because we've taught the biblical principles, we expect the wives to be obedient to their husbands, as the Bible says they should be. I mean, that's not too much to expect. I just don't think in other terms that you don't, because if it's not true, then you're not a part of faith assembly, even though you have a seat out there. And then when you get in trouble, you want us to give you a rule. We can't do that. But we expect wives to be modest and submissive. I didn't say you had to wear gray socks. <laughs> like one man years ago when we started this church thought all the ladies ought to be required to wear those granny gray socks. Well, <laughs> if I knew then what I know now, all I'd have to do is say, just let somebody start the style, and they will. And I'm not being facetious because of men the same way. I mean, those monster shoes and mountain climber boots and worn out jeans and football t-shirts that women wear right down in the middle of town, 4th and Broadway. They would scream their heads off. Would have 10 years ago if somebody said, that's the way you've got to dress. No one will see you, but you've got to wear it for one day in your living room. They would scream their heads off in protest and they'll wear them right downtown. Men do the same thing. I'm just saying that modesty of dress is what we've taught here, not how to dress, not how long your hair should be as a man, or a woman for that matter. We've always said if we look from the rear and can't tell whether you're a man or a woman, your hair's too long if you're a man. And if we can't tell by the way you're dressed, you're dressed wrong. You ought to be able to look from the rear and tell whether it's a man or a woman from the hair and the clothes, but you cannot. You just cannot sometimes. Absolutely. I've turned to my wife and I said, which is it? <laughs> or she's asked me, which or what is it? What is it? You cannot tell. Some of those boys are so pretty with their long hair and all done up. You really don't know if it's a boy or a girl. Well, of course, there are ways to tell, but, you know, that isn't the obvious way. So we expect, you know, women to not want to dress like the spirit of this age, women's lip, but we don't stand out there and say, hey, you can't come in here unless you're dressed a certain way, because you cannot legislate these things, you see. We can't tell you how to do this or do that, but we can lay out the principles of what a person who is seeking the will of God will do. For the same reason, you take the matter of head covering. We've never legislated on that because the shepherdship covering teachers were teaching the wrong thing about covering, then we taught on it. But we've never set up a rule or put up a list on the wall of the doctrines that we adhere to and say, now, You've got to meet this or match it. Now, we expect a woman or a man, once they hear the teaching on 1 Corinthians 11 and see that it is the Word of God, we're assuming you see that, that there's no problem from then on. If I stood up here and started to prophesy, but before I did put my hat on, you'd be the first to say something wrong. But how many are really concerned about obeying 1 Corinthians 11 if it's a woman who doesn't cover her head if she prays or prophesies in public. Because he said if a man prays with his head covered or prophesies with his head covered, he said that's wrong. And turning it around, he said if a woman doesn't cover her head, that's wrong. Now why would we have to legislate on that? It's plain that a child could understand it. And we've got teaching on it, so I'm not going to be teaching on it tonight. I'm just mentioning here are things where you apply principles. Because all the rules and laws in the world wouldn't cause you to obey whatever we said you should do with respect to things like that. Now, within limits, we're talking about applying principles. There are just some things you can't do and you must do to even get in here. But I trust you understand what we're talking about, that you can't legislate in all of these areas. Well, it's like natural childbirth. We don't have a position in this church, but because some were trying to legislate faith. Here's what faith is. Here's what faith isn't in this situation of having your baby. It was legalism and binding some women who didn't have the faith for it. So we didn't stand at the door and say, hey, you can't come in here unless you can have a child at home. 
But it was getting almost that bad from some because they were trying to legislate faith and say if you do this or don't do that, it's not faith or it is faith. So we had to state the faith principle. What was it? Well, you can't legislate faith. That's what it was. And so it is with many teachings. It's Romans 6.17, as we've said, that you have to apply, that you must obey from the heart the form of teaching that your pastor or your church delivers unto you. There's no way for us to lay down rules about all of these many areas and aspects of your life. We brought up the whole subject of women should not wear that which pertaineth to a man because the Word of God said that. But we didn't legislate on it. Occasionally a little static filtered back and you find out how mature you are as a pastor. Are some daughters giving their mothers trouble over, I'm the only one in my class that can't show my behind. I'll just tell you the way it is. Trust you're mature enough to receive it. Because that's all the tight genes do. And that's what they're designed for. And you know that, and I know that. So we just said it. But we've never legislated. And I don't look to see what any woman's wearing, whether it's a dress or what. But as a part of the whole revelation, that came out. We brought that out. We've never had a sermon on it. But you see, if we laid down a rule and you obeyed it because the church required it, you couldn't wear man's pants into this church as a woman and you obeyed it just to get in, you would still be disobedient if you didn't want to do it in your heart. So we don't legislate things like that. You know, what kind of toothpaste you use or whatever. But what I'm trying to get at, and I want you to see, is that there is something you ought to examine in your own heart if you're struggling with what the Word of God said. And don't say that's his interpretation. I didn't make it up. A woman shall not wear that which pertaineth to a man. They wear the suits, the ties, and they even call them pants suits now. They don't call them slacks anymore. I'm not going to get up here and preach on don't wear pants or shorts. That's not my ministry or lipstick or watch TV. And if God ever gets to the place where he says, separate those who won't obey in the little things from those who obey in everything, then we'll do that. But until he does, we're going to stay with Galatians. Now, he won't contradict Galatians, but he may make some separation that he doesn't allow us to make. And when you find yourself letting your child wear her boy's pants to school but not to church, you see, you're still disobedient. You ought to settle the matter. Wear them all the time or wear them none of the time. It's not the slacks or the pants. That's not the issue. It's having a heart of obedience. I don't want to ever be accused my ministry is anti-feminine or shorts or slacks because if I was going to really get onto something, I'd get off to the hot pants and the short shorts like Branham did. Women wearing bobbed hair, shorts, women preachers. He didn't like any of that. Well, we could talk about whatever you want to talk about. It isn't the pants we're talking about. It doesn't matter the pants or the television or lipstick or whether you smoke a cigarette, go to the doctor, take medicine, borrow money. That isn't the point. When you find out what God's Word teaches about a thing, then just humbly submit to it. If you've got a right heart, you'll do it. If it's in your heart to want to dress like the spirit of this age as women are men, then all the rules of the world won't change your heart. You've got to deal with your heart. Anybody who's honest really knows what the male dress is all about, women wearing men's clothing, is because they've taken over the dominant role in the home, so they're going to dress like men. It's that simple. Here's a part of an article I cut out of a magazine or whatever. Here's a woman who got delivered from being a lesbian, homosexual spirit. And the person who's interviewing her said, I found in working with lesbians and so on that a definite change is necessary in the areas such as dress and mannerisms as well as attitudes 
toward the opposite sex. Have you found this to be true? And the change lesbian woman said, yes, I found this to be difficult at times. Why, she asked. And listen to what she says, the former lesbian. She says, because I despised feminine clothes and had a deep-seated hatred of men. It's the spirit of women's lib and lesbianism for you want to dress like a male. It's the spirit of this age. See, for that reason, you should seek the Lord about dressing like a woman or dressing like a man. Some men don't dress like men. You know, it works both ways. But it's the spirit of lesbianism. You see, so many women hate feminine clothes. They've got the spirit of this age. It isn't a question, you see, of whether you can wear slacks or pants or not. What woman do you see anymore that does not have a man's shirt on, man's pants, and a haircut like a man? You see it everywhere. Even the sideburns. They don't have them, so they have to cut them in. And if you're here tonight with that sort of a haircut, you see we are just helping you to let it grow. It's the spirit of this age. But we are laboring to show it isn't a question of how you cut your hair or how long it is or whether you wear lipstick or smoke a cigarette or take a pill. It's a question of attitudes. Once you hear what God wants you to hear from this pulpit and then you see that's in the Word of God, I assume you've got the heart that wants to see it's there. Why would you keep coming if you didn't believe what we're preaching was out of the Word? Once you see it, God no longer gives you the right to pick or choose whether or not you're going to obey it. No. Only He has that right, and He is picking and choosing right now in this end time those who have a heart to obey Him in everything, and those who are picking and choosing, saying, well, I'll please pastor, so I won't do anything to offend Him, and then you do what you please when you're out. You haven't obeyed anybody, me or the Word or God or anyone else. He doesn't give you a right to pick and choose if it's in the Word. It isn't a matter of slacks or cigarettes or whatever. It's obedience to what He says. There's no point arguing it isn't there because it is there. And anyone who comes out of lesbianism and homosexuality knows the source of these things. These white duck overalls you wear came right out of the homosexual community. And the athletic shoes. The homosexuals and lesbians laugh at you people. They say, we start the trend. They're the first to wear the white overhaul. Painter's suit. You know what I'm talking about? And the athletic shoes. They say, we start all this, and then the straight community picks it up. And then they go off to something else, and then you pick it up again. Everything they said, we've started. The straight pick it up. And it becomes the style. Homosexuals. Sodomites. And all of these women running around in their own feminine dress are trying to look like what they say they hate, men. It's a spirit. You know, if women's lib ever made any sense at all to me, they'd have to start dressing like women. But they dress like men, which doesn't make any sense. And they're anti-man from the word go. We're chauvinists and you name it. Well, of course, as I show in my book, Every Wind of Doctrine, some of them at least saw the inconsistency in that, and so they do become more feminine. And I list several groups like that. Well, simply because the hour is so short, and God is making up a body of overcomers because there is no time left for you to decide whether you're going to obey these things or not. Then if you don't find it in your heart to obey, you ought to be honest and not try to follow a ministry that proclaims the whole counsel of God and doesn't legislate but lays out the principles and is going to keep laying them out until you either line up or God will remove you. At least be honest and not attach yourself to a ministry that lays out these things that you find so distasteful that you have to chew on or lay on the shelf or say, oh, why can't we find a happy medium somewhere? Well, I'll tell you where you'll find a happy medium. You'll have to go find a fence. 
Because fence sitters are the ones that are not going anywhere. And so you need to take a little admonishment and warning that God himself is picking and choosing, making up a list right now of those who are hungering and thirsting after righteousness, who come into faith assembly to find out what are we going to hear this week from the Lord so we can go out and do it. Making up a list of those who have that attitude and those who come to pick and choose and say, well, he's a man, that's his word, and whatever. And you're going to do what you want anyway. We see, I'm not doing the picking and choosing. He is. And it's not a question, as we've said, of whether it's head covering, whether we use real wine in the communion. You get questions about everything. Well, I won't take it if it's wine. Others, I won't drink it unless it is wine. They use wine. It isn't a question about all of these thousands of situations that arise of whether or not we have a position or not. Does the Word of God teach it? Have you heard it? From that point on, God doesn't give you the right to pick and choose. I don't know how he looks at you when you don't know, but when you know, he expects you to obey. Amen. Father, in Jesus' name, as we draw to a close our studies in Colossians, it is my prayer that young or old will find a heart beating within their breasts that is willing, anxious, yearning to obey in all that you have taught us. I pray that you would guide them by the Spirit as they meditate upon the Word. There will not be a one loss to disobedience, indifference, or worldliness, but that we might all be perfect images examples of the Lord Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. Amen.